Suddenly and without warning, the Chinese attack. They check the 8th Army advance and block the 10th Corps at Udam. Chinese sweep south in overwhelming numbers. Elements of the 3rd deployed to protect 10th Corps' exposed western flank. Overwhelmingly outnumbered, they are driven back and trapped on the east side of the Chosen Reservoir. In desperate fighting, these heavily depleted units withdraw to Hagaru. Lieutenant Colonel Don Faith uh, was in command of 132 Infantry uh, when hostilities broke out in Korea in 1950. From about 27 November, when the Chinese launched their attacks uh, at the Chosen Rev Reservoir, which caught the Americans by surprise, uh, through one December when he was killed, uh, he displayed remarkable leadership under fire, uh, tough decisions that he had to make in order to save his battalion. From le personally leading counterattacks under fire, uh, to the tough decisions he had to make in sub-zero weather on, on who would live and who would die as he attempted to try to save his battalion uh, as it retrograded uh, from the Chosen Reservoir down to Hagaru Ri, where it linked up with the, uh, the First Marines. Increasing casualties, decreasing ammunition, medical supplies uh, led Colonel Faith to realize that their position was, was completely untenable and, and they had to do something on their own to, to escape the position that, that they had found themselves in. He immediately got his men prepared to handle this, this unexpected turn of developments. And he was all over his lines, exhorting his men, showing by example, uh, getting them prepared to move around, switch positions, and to handle with, with what was estimated later uh, uh, the, the onslaught of seven separate regiments, the Chinese forces. One of the toughest decisions that Lieutenant Colonel Faith had to make um, is personally leading the assaults up the hills to clear the enemy off the hills to get his battalion out. Uh, he could have stayed down below at a Jeep command and control vehicle uh, near the radio, but he chose to personally lead by example uh, and go up the hill and remove the enemy. Uh, it was on one of these assaults that he was mortally wounded by a grenade. And uh, he was given the option to be evacuated or get other wounded soldiers out. He chose to evacuate other wounded soldiers in front of himself um, and stay in command of his battalion. Uh, and I believe he knew what, what his decision was. I believe he knew that the decision was gonna cost him his life. And this was a key moment because this allowed the rest of the convoy to continue onwards to the south. Colonel Faith was wounded. His men put him in a cab of the truck at the head of the column. A barrage of fire at some point hit the truck. It went off road. They went down a road and the body never made it to the aid station. And that's why it was listed as missing in action. Several months later is, is when uh, the official Medal of Honor citation went out. Uh, and this happened in June of 1951. General of the Army, Omar Bradley, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, presents the Medal of Honor to Mrs. Don C. Faith, all for devotion to their country, over and beyond the call of duty. We came home and really thought about it and, and decided that there was no way they were finding my father. North Korea was inaccessible at that time. The possibility of getting that far up in North Korea seemed very remote. The team was led out to a site that was um, by a set of railroad tracks that you could also see the Chosen Reservoir from this site. Uh, when the team started to excavate, they did uncover remains. Teams consist of about you know, 12 to 15 personnel to go out and actually do the recovery. We have the anthropologist who goes with us, but we are facilitating everything that they do uh, as far as screening the dirt and doing all the digging out on the site. As you're there for hours upon hours screening, and it's kind of mind-numbing to screen for so long, or, or you know, the, the back-raking pain of digging and using the pickaxe and you know, going through rock, it really starts to wear on you, especially after you know, 30 to 60 days of doing that. And so we like to talk about the, the actual service member that we're looking for, and it kind of brings it all home. Forensic anthropologists go out to various sites and excavate the human remains and material evidence and we bring them back to the lab and we analyze the skeletons and uh, the material evidence. 
the identification process, as you know, is a very tedious one. They had taken DNA from his brother, they had taken my DNA, and he had dental records that were pretty unusual. So they found him. <laughs> 63, almost 63 years later, 62 years, I guess it was in the fall. And for a few of us who actually had the chance to meet some of these families, uh, it, it's really a powerful experience to talk to them and, and to see the pain that they're still going through, uh, still waiting, you know, 40, 50, 60 years for their loved ones to come back home. December 1950, my grandparents, they followed the U.S. troops um, during the Hungnam evacuation after the Chosen, uh, Battle of Chosen. So they moved down to South Korea um, on a U.S. ships they used to evacuate uh, about 91,000 North Korean civilian refugees, and my grandparents were two of them. These guys actually died in East Chosen, and my grandparents we were able to safely evacuate. Yeah, my grandfather, he talks about how grateful he still is. He is 85 now, and he is pretty grateful about that he was able to make it on that ship because he said not everybody could, and he was able to make it. JPAC and the identification lab I really don't have words to express what I feel. The, uh, I, I would say thank you from the depths of my heart. And thank you for his family. <laughs>